Well, welcome to Toastmasters Beta Bay. Now, for those of you that are Toastmasters out there, you know exactly what to expect. But for those of you who aren't Toastmasters or are new to this program, let me tell you what's in store for you. Well, Toastmasters is an organization that has two primary purposes. First, we're looking to help you improve your communication skills to as much as you're comfortable with. Yep, that's it. There's no comparison of your speaking skills to other people or any bars to reach. It's what do you need to improve? And what do you want to improve? Now, the second thing that Toastmasters brings is leadership. Because as history has shown us, great leaders of our history have been great communicators. The two go hand in hand. And today, you're going to hear a couple of great speakers who are also great leaders. That's Toastmasters, Bay to Bay. Now, our first speaker today has been well known in District 4 as well as around the Toastmasters world. Henry Miller has been speaking in international contests for quite some time. And today, he's going to take the advanced manual, and he's going to work on the storytelling concept and be able to bring some lessons to us. I'd like to introduce Mr. Henry Miller with a speech titled, Tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, honored guest. I have a confession to make. In my wonder years growing up in Trinidad, West Indies, one of my favorite songs was America the Beautiful. Somehow that song made me believe that only in America it was impossible to ever dream an impossible dream. But with the passing of time, I came to realize that it didn't matter where you lived. But first, if you had a dream and you were prepared to follow that dream today and not tomorrow, you too can make your dreams come true. I came to that realization when I was struggling with one of my dreams, trying to decide if I should surrender it from, for tomorrow, and was getting some advice from all my friends, family. Oh, I was all confused, all those know-it-alls. I called them Mr. and Mrs. Wright. <laughs> but as time went on, I met a Native American named Big Chief, who introduced me to the legend of the dream catcher and made me a believer in following my dreams when he said, son, tomorrow does not exist. Only today does. And then he reached into a little box he had and took out a dream catcher and explained the legend to me. You see, Native Americans believe that dreams are in the air all around us, both good and bad. And so they would hang these dream catchers in their lodges, their teepees, and over the crib of their infants. Because they believed that the good dreams would pass through the center hole and into the hearts of the sleeping ones. And the bad dreams, well, they would be caught in its outer web, where they will perish at the light of dawn. So today, I want to ask each and every one of you here today to remember one of your dreams that you surrendered for tomorrow. And I also want to you to remember that Mr. or Mrs. Wright, that know-it-all, who came in to show you every little thing that could possibly go wrong with your dream. And although you felt in your heart that you were right and they were wrong, still, you surrendered. You surrendered because they were able to convince your parents your friends, even your pets, that you were going crazy and somebody had to save you. So now you're saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> and everybody's happy. Until a few years later, when you see your bright idea on TV with some smarty laughing all the way to the bank, talking about taking his dream IPO. <laughs> and that's when you are PO'd, <laughs> claiming somebody stole your dream. But as Big Chief would tell you, maybe perhaps you didn't have a dream. Because a dream without a plan is just a wish. And there's just one place in this whole wide world that promises to make all of our wishes come true. Disneyland. <laughs> in your dreams, you must see the possibilities. You got to wake up to make it happen, or you got to follow that dream. And believe me, it's never too early or never too late. 
I began following my dreams way back in kindergarten in Sister Philomena's class. Oh, Sister would daily make us close our eyes, put our heads on the desk, and travel to wherever our heart desired. And I would always head for the land of the free and the home of the brave. Little did I know all sister ever wanted back then was just a little peace and quiet. <laughs> but I became a virtual traveler. And when I was able to see those spacious skies, those amber ways of grain, and travel from sea to shining sea in the flesh, I was amazed to find amid the oceans of wealth those little streams of poverty. But in those streams, I met many Americans, like Big Chief, living his dream, living his dream as a chief mechanic. And then there were those who, too, had surrendered their dream for tomorrow for tomorrow that may never come. Well, my fellow Toastmasters, we can make today that tomorrow. But first, we must find a way to bring that dream back into our hearts and start living it daily. But first, we must have a plan. See, the plan is the glue that will make you stick to that dream. And when you are so blessed that your dream has become a reality, then it will be your turn to start paying it forward. Then you can go out and tell the world that there's just one Mr. or Mrs. Wright who can make all of our dreams come true. And that Mr. or Mrs. Wright is you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? Please do. <laughs> First of all, extraordinary speech. What was Thank your inspiration? You. Actually, this is a true story. I was on tour by first time I came to America. And I was in Arizona, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I was really thinking, I was homesick. I wanted to go back home. And I met some Native Americans who wanted to take me to meet their spiritual leader. But when I discovered it, it, it they were it taking me to meet Jack Daniels. Mm -hmm. That's when I decided, oh no. <laughs> you know. I have met that spiritual leader. <laughs> but luckily I was able to meet Big Chief, a real spiritual leader who actually taught me how to follow my dreams, and here I am today, still following my dreams. And how did you get from New Mexico to the Bay Area? Oh, it's a long story. Long story. <laughs> <laughs> but it, this was my first um, North American tour, and I did it twice with a theater company when I was doing music in my first life. And uh, here I am today now doing s speeches with Toastmasters. And, uh, you know, there's a similarity. I, it's a, you know transition from music to speech. Wonderful. Well, you look like you're comfortable speaking. Now, some people still have that little bit of nervousness. How long did it take you to get from being nervous in front of an audience to being very comfortable? Well, you know, my parents told me that, and this is the true story, I was, they thought I would be mute, deaf mute, mm -hmm. because I always, was always very quiet. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm doing some catching up now. You know, perhaps that's... <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> took some time for me to get comfortable. You well, just have to do it. I, I'd like to thank you very much for coming out here tonight and sharing with the audience such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Part of Toastmasters is not just becoming comfortable speaking, but it's also becoming comfortable giving feedback so that the speaker can learn from that one. And I'd like to now introduce Mr. Marty Highland to give some performance feedback. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and especially Henry. Henry, I always gauge somebody in the beginning with your beginning, and that is how you take the stage. And you took the stage in the manner that I would suggest for everybody. 
because you address the Toastmaster, you address the audience, and you have this presence that you're so friendly that you just draw people in. So great job of getting our attention. Then the gestures you use. I mean, you open your arms up, and you're so, it, you're so inviting. And then when something is close to your soul, you, you clutch, you've clutched your breast. And so every, your gestures were, were something that I wish I could do as well. I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed with your gestures. And then you opened up and you talked to this guy. I mean, it was, it was I felt, I really felt something when you were, when you're up here. Also, your vocal variety. It's, it, you pause when you have to emphasize. You use a different, higher voice when you're, when you're at a quicker pace you have to get us along. And then you, and you just slow down when you're making your point and you punch that point. You also have humor. And humor is so important because, I mean, it just draws people to you. I think you probably have a lot of friends. I would <laughs> I had expect you have a lot of friends. Because humor is such a, I, I mean, you, you played with the words like IPO to PO. I mean, I, I just love that. Also, let's see, you, said, you also said something about tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow may never come. And you said that during the last maybe minute and a half or two minutes of your speech, which was also the title. So I might suggest that the title be something a little more creative. And I'm not exactly sure how to do that without a little bit more thought, but planning for tomorrow or something. But tomorrow is a little too general. So I think it, it would help if you said something that would be just a little more, you know, draw us in a little bit more. But your conclusion, I mean, what a great point. I mean, this is something I'm going to remember for a long time. And I mean, it, and you addressed us all, and we knew where the conclusion was. So great job, Henry, and I hope you do well at the next speech contest. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Marty. Wonderful job. Well, in our next segment, you're in for a treat because District 4 has started a new contest, the Diamond Director Contest. And in these next three segments, you're gonna see the three entries. The first one is the winner, the San Francisco Toastmasters. Enjoy these next segments. The best part about coming to a meeting it's the feeling that you're in a group of friends and that you're here to improve your public speaking skills and there's a very supportive group to help you in that process. Good evening fellow Toastmasters. I walked in here the first few meetings as a guest and I am just amazed at the ability and the skills that people already have here, whether they've been members for a month or they've been members for five years. At a point in my life and in my career where I was wanting to practice my speaking skills, I was a little rough around the edges, and what better place to do it than San Francisco Toastmasters. This is a community, we enjoy each other, we inspire each other, and that's what really makes it great. As we all know, evaluation is the single most important part of Toastmasters experience. And at Next Step, since we believe in helping others grow and get really good, we take our evaluation sessions very seriously. With one proper evaluation that most clubs do, and a round robin, whereby every single member of the audience gets an opportunity to provide feedback to the speaker. We spend sometimes seven to eight minutes giving, doing round robin evaluations, because everybody at Next Step loves to give evaluation. I particularly like the engineering side of the talk. I think you could do more with analogies. We tape each and every meeting. It helps when you can see yourself on, on tape. That starts with the people. The people here are very distinguished. There's just so much fun in the room. I always see hear a lot of laughter. This is the place to try things, right? To try humor in your speeches. We're going to clap for you regardless. <laughs> and of course, at the next step, you'll get some really, really good feedback as well. Do you like to have fun? Do you like to have fun? Do you like to have fun? Today is your lucky day. An opportunity to meet fun and meet fantastic people is available right now. Golden Gate Toastmasters. Golden Gate Toastmasters. Golden Gate Toastmasters. 
It's been described as challenging, fun, spontaneous, awesome. It's the perfect environment to step out of your public speaking comfort zone. But wait, there's even more! Not only do you get to improve your communication and leadership skills, you get to hang out and socialize with amazing people. After every meeting, we go to the pub. But, but wait, there's, there's even more! Golden Gate Toastmasters does a lot of other social activities, such as summer barbecue, the holiday party. We go hiking together, sailing. Visit www.goldengatetoastmasters.org to learn more. Or even better, come by, visit. I hope you enjoyed that segment. Now that contest was created so that Toastmasters can start taking advantage of the social media out there and creating that viral buzz about our Toastmasters Club. I'd like to bring special attention. Now, by the way, those were the three finalists. And I'd like to bring attention to the producers of those segments. From the San Francisco Toastmasters, we had Kumar Pritam, Andrew Schmeling, Laura Williams, and Cindy Yu. From the Golden Gate Toastmasters, that was Christian Salveson and from the Next Step Toastmasters, Birgit Starmans and Joseph Hatala. All right, well, we've heard one of the fantastic speakers today, but you know what? We're not done, because we have some more in store for you. Our next speaker, Maria Leon, is going to inspire you, and she's gonna inspire you to think a little differently. Her objectives today are to take you out of your normal train of thought and kind of put a little seed in your mind to have a new one. I'd like to invite Maria Leon, What would the world be like if there were only fast food restaurants? <laughs> More importantly, if you could only eat at McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, how healthy would you be? We all know that food is good for you and bad for you, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But what the, have you ever wondered why? What does the food do in your body that makes it good or bad? In 2004, I worked for Schwab in the IT department. At lunchtime, I walked into my manager, Carl's office. He was an older gentleman, gray hair, easygoing. Me, I was a type A. Fast, efficient, every second counting. Lunch, that was an opportunity to catch up on emails, voicemails, text messages. Carl, however, had a different mindset. Lunchtime was a time to relax, talk to people, nourish your body. Maria, what are you having for lunch? Do you have any fruit? Yep, cherry pie. <laughs> How about a vegetable? <laughs> French fry? <laughs> Thinking about any protein? Hamburger? <laughs> Where do you get the energy to do what you do? Starbucks. <laughs> that is not healthy. Look, Carl, I can't wait for that day when I extend my arm and I get that shot of nutrition in the morning then I'll have to worry about eating and cooking the rest of the day. I just don't have time. And by the way, I'll have that report on your desk by 5 o'clock. I, I got a meeting to go to. I get on my conference call. And now I'm working on this report with the other hand. My phone cell goes up. Hey, oh gosh, that must be my kids. I pick it up. What? OK. Three days later. My arm was out. I was getting that shot, not the shot of nutrition that I talked to Carl about. It was my first shot, injection of chemotherapy. Three days ago on Friday, March 19th, 3 p.m., my mammogram was positive. By 8 p.m., I was in surgery. Today, I was on starting my, acce my accelerated chemo program. If I survived it, I would have an opportunity in five years to live beyond that. In 2009, I reached my five-year mark. I was a survivor. But I looked up on the shelf and saw Lily's picture. Oh my gosh, she was in the same program as me. Those five years, her cancer spread silently. Brain cancer, brain tumor, she's dead. Oh my gosh, her little kid. And my mind started racing. Was I really healthy? How did I know? When they told me I had cancer, my blood results were fine. They were perfect. I was perfect on paper. Yet, I had cancer. There is no test that's going to tell you 100% you're fine. How do you know you're healthy? 
I didn't want to be the next Lily. So that month, I enrolled in Bowman College, and I took a course to be a nutrition educator. And I discovered I wasn't healthy, not in a way that I felt would prevent me from being the next Lily. I started, I discovered that acidity and alkaline played a big role. As on, the, on the pH scale, acid, uh, acid occurs at the 6.0 end. That's the lower side. It's yellow, and it, and it happens and occurs with foods such as sugars, fast foods, caffeine. The, the body is balanced in the middle at 7.3. And that's a lovely green. And it has fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. For 10 years, I had been a medical laboratory technician before I joined Schwab. And I knew that cancer occurs because the cell metabolism shuts down. But what happens when it shuts down? What does that mean? When it shuts down, the cell dies. It explodes. And the waste spills out and creates a local acidic environment. And that causes the calcium in the blood to precipitate out. And those calcium flakes are what shows up on the mammogram and are the indicators of breast cancer. Oh my gosh, I gotta go see, I gotta test if I'm acidic. And I run out to the store and I get the urine pH strips and I test myself, what? I'm yellow? And my twin daughters, nine years old, copy everything they do. They grab the strips and they test themselves. Mommy, we're green. I never thought that I would be jealous of a nine-year-old's liquid waste product. I wanted to be green. So I rush out the Jamba Juice, I get a cup of carrot juice, and I bump myself up to green for an hour. The girls, they're young and vibrant. They stay up at green for two days. They have durability. But you and I, because of our previous bad habits, we fall, we slip back down. But then you go back, you do it again, and you slip back down but not as far. And then you do it again. And you slip that back down, not as far again. Today, I'll stay up for two days. I have mastered durability. What I hope you can begin to understand is the impact of food inside your body, what it does. Look, I don't want you to get that phone call. Educate yourself. Don't be that picture on the shelf that your friends and family use to inspire themselves to eat healthy. Thank you. Toastmaster. Wonderful job. Okay. Mind if I interview you? Oh, sure. All right. So how long <laughs> have you been talking about nutrition to audiences? About um, eight years. Eight years. Since were, then. <laughs> were you always as smooth on stage? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, you look pretty smooth up here. Uh, Let's give another round of applause for Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Again, it wouldn't be a speech without some feedback. So I'd like to welcome up Mr. Eric Leone. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and especially Maria. Your objective was to inspire, and I have to say that it was an incredibly inspirational speech. First and foremost, you came up here, and your introduction was, you asked us a question about fast food. And I think the majority of us, being educated, have a pretty good idea of what that can do to our bodies. And you kind of mentioned, what if the world was just composed of McDonald's and places like that? And already right there, I could feel, uh, personally, how much or less energy, essentially, I would have. And then, you went into a personal story, which I thought was fantastic. It, you talked about your coworker, Carl, Carl, and essentially how you were impacted when you received that phone call, and how it really, really brought you down, essentially. And you also brought up your friend, Lily, which was a really, when you mentioned that, that was a shot to the heart, I think, not only to myself, but a lot of people here. It really hammered in a point that you were trying to get across, which was eat better. And I thought one of the best ways to do that is with a personal story, which you had, of course. And also, you threw a lot of facts in there. 
such as acids, or calciums, and, and so forth, flakes, and so forth, things that most of us don't know about. And I thought that was really powerful as well. It brought a lot more power to your message. Now, another thing I want to talk about is your delivery. I thought when you were up here, your stage presence was amazing. You had incredible energy. Your body movements tied into that. You would come over here, and then when you were talking about something more positive, like when you wanted to be like your children, you were jealous of them, you kind of brought your energy level up to match that. When you talked about Lily, you brought it down. And very engaging. Now, some things that I think I'd like to point out where that you may want to put a little more emphasis on is you had a lot of content for that period of time. You may want to condense some of that and focus a little bit more on the real activity of eating healthier. You know, one thing that you did mention was you tell, told us to educate ourselves, which I thought was, was powerful. However, maybe you could have given us some examples with your call to action on how we could do that. Maybe certain websites, certain courses, or whatever it may be. But I do want to finish up with your conclusion. You talked about the picture of us being an inspiration for our families moving forward if we didn't take care of ourselves. And I thought that really hammered in your point. Really impressed. Thank you very much. And I hope to hear more of your speeches. Mr. Testmaster. Eric, thank you very much. And it's Lamori, is that right? That is correct. All right. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you for joining us today on the Toastmasters Beta Bay. Hope you learned something. I know I did. And if you'd like to find out anything more about Toastmasters, especially here in the Bay Area, go to the website for District 4, d4tm.org. Thanks again for joining us. Good job for you.